This morning we are going to be covering one of the sweetest stories in all of the Bible. It is a story of romance, a story of heartbreak, a sadness, of love, and of boldness. It is a story about God's sovereignty and his work of redemption. We are going to be looking at Ruth's story this morning. So take your Bibles and open them to the book of Ruth, to the book of Ruth. And before, before we get in, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help as we study. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning eager to hear from you. We have a huge task ahead of us, Father, to look at a story that so many of your people are familiar with. So I pray this morning as we look at this text, as we look at this story that you would open our eyes anew in fresh wonder, that we would see the themes of your providence, of your sovereignty, of your love and your loyalty that are just sprinkled all throughout this little book. Help me to stay out of the way of the text and help your people be edified by the preaching of your word. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Our task this morning is ambitious. What we would normally cover in at least four messages, we're going to cover and one today. We're going to survey the entire book of Ruth this morning. And the story begins in chapter one with an extraordinarily bitter providence. Look with me at verse one of, of chapter one. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Melhon and Chilion, for they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malhan and Chilion died, so that the women was left without her two sons and her husband. These first couple of verses set the stage for the rest of the story. We're introduced to several characters two of which here will be central to the entire book. And the first thing that the author of Ruth does is he tells us the time period that this story takes place. He says it's in the days when the judges ruled. Now understand that these were dark days in Israel, arguably some of the darkest days in the nation's history. This period of around three to 400 years is literally the dark ages of Israel. This was the, t the time after Joshua's death and before the installation of Saul as king. The judges were military governors who led Israel in conquest and in control of Canaan. And like Israel's kings, these men were deeply flawed. So much so that the people just did whatever they wanted to do. The time of the judges was essentially a time of anarchy. We read about this time in the book of Judges. In Judges chapter 2, verse 10 through 16, we read this. And all the generation who were gathered to their fathers, there rose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods, from among whom the gods of the people were around them, and bowed to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. The final verse of the book of Judges is repeated all throughout the book, and it is its central theme, summing up the entire book, summing up that entire time period, and it is this, Judges 21-25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So the time, the setting of the book of Ruth is when the judges ruled. 
It's a time of darkness. It's a time of anarchy. It is a time when the people did whatever they wanted to do and there was no leadership in Israel. The second thing that the author does after identifying for us the time period is he tells us the situation. First, the setting. It's the book of Judges. The situation, here it is. There's a severe famine in the land. And when there's famine, people are starving. And when people are starving, they're desperate. And desperate people do horrible, dangerous, awful things like pillage and kill and rape. And it's this situation being so bad, famine in the land of Israel, anarchy in the land, no leadership at all, everyone doing what they're doing. It is this situation that leads a godly man and his wife, named Elimelech and Naomi, to actually leave their country. This is what they do. They journey. Elimelech, who is a resident of Bethlehem, takes his wife Naomi and their two sons, and they make their dangerous journey to an unexpected place. They leave their home and their family and their country, and they go to Moab, which was a nation that was Israel's enemy. It'd be like you packing up today because the situation in our country is so bad, getting on a plane and flying over to Iraq. That's what's going on here. The Moabites were hated by Israel. They were the descendants of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter in the book of Genesis. The the Moabites hated Israel religiously. Not only nationally were they enemies, but religiously they were competitors. Israel worshipped Yahweh, the true God, and the Moabites worshipped Chemish. And Chemish, like all of these pagan gods, was bloodthirsty and wicked. And part of worshiping Chemish was offering to him human sacrifice. Moab was an enemy of Israel. But Elimelech was desperate. And as bad a situation that was in Moab, it was better than what was going on in Israel. At least... In Moab, there's food. So Elimelech takes his family, and off they go. And in verse 3, a bad situation for this family gets even worse. Elimelech dies. Naomi then has to watch as her two sons marry pagan Moabite wives. They're barren, they're childless, and then her two sons die. Over a period of 10 years, Naomi suffers incredible loss and affliction. In order to survive, her family are driven from their home to an even darker place. In this foreign land where she is a total outsider, knowing no one, worshiping Yahweh, not Chemish, her husband dies. Being a widow in this time was a dangerous thing. Thing. Many times widows were destined to a life of begging or prostitution to survive. But Naomi still had her sons. They would take care of her. But even then, there's heartache. Her sons did what breaks the hearts of many Christian mothers. They marry those who don't worship the true God. And Naomi has to suffer a mother's pain as she watches her sons do what is dishonorable to Yahweh. So there's Naomi, exiled in a place that's not home, grieving the death of her husband and lamenting that her sons married foreigners, foreigners who very likely can lead her sons to worship a false god. And it gets even worse for her. As if that's not bad enough, both of her sons die. And there's no grandchildren for Naomi. For a decade, Naomi suffers. Blow after blow after blow. Excruciating every step on her path, even worse than the one before. With her husbands and her sons dead, having no man to provide for her or her daughters-in-law, Naomi's life 
is looking incredibly bleak. Verse six. Then she arose with her daughters-in-laws to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she sent out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. In the midst of all of her darkness, there's, there's this little glimmer of hope. Naomi hears that in Israel, the famine has ended and, and there's actually food to eat. So after 10 hellish years in Moab, it was finally time for her to go home. Accompanied by Orpah and Ruth, she begins the dangerous journey home. Verse 8. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go return each one of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. Naomi knows that these women will not be accepted in Israel. They're Moabites. They're Israel's enemies. If they continue on their journey with her back to Israel, they're going to suffer shame and isolation and scorn. No one in Israel is going to be accepting of these people. They will be hated. So Naomi reasons that it's better for them to at least stay in their own country than to go with her to her country and be hated. Naomi often gets a bad reputation by preachers and authors. They portray this woman as just some this bitter old hag, but that's not the case. We shouldn't look down on her. She is a woman who has been crushed by a bitter providence. She has borne the weight of incredible pain, and yet through it all, she still speaks in a way that reveals a godliness about her. Instead of being angry at God, instead of lashing out against him and saying, I will never follow Yahweh because Yahweh has dealt with me a bad hand. She actually greets her daughters in a way with Yahweh's blessing. She's still following Yahweh, although her life at this point, frankly, sucks. Cannot get worse. So she gives Yahweh's blessing to her daughters-in-law. She kisses them goodbye and all of the women weep. Verse 10. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they're grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the, Lord, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. These verses are strange to us. Reading them 3,500 years after the fact. We saw in our study a couple weeks ago of Tamar and Judah that in these days, leveret marriage was the custom. In, a culture, in this culture, women were low on the social scale. Marriage was the safeguard to to protect them from poverty or prostitution. When a man died, his brother or close relative would marry the widow so that way the deceased man's family line would continue and so that way that woman could be protected and provided for. Naomi tells Orpah and, or Naomi tells Orpah and Ruth that she has no husband. And even if she were to get married that day, it would be 10 or 12, 14 years before she would have a a teenage boy to give them to marry. And and they're not going to wait for that. She says she has nothing to give them. They have nothing to gain by staying with her. So they should just stay in Moab. And then Naomi says something profound. She says this, The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Naomi has a correct theological understanding of her situation. All of her troubles, all of her pain, all of her suffering did not happen apart from God. It did not happen because God lost control. She understands that God is sovereign, that God orchestrates all things, that he oversees and directs all things. God's not up in heaven wrestling with his hands 
terrified at what's going on. No, he is in total control. And Naomi rightly understands this. She knows that all of this pain, all of this suffering, all of this heartache, this is coming at the very least from God's hand, permitting hand. And we'll see this theme of providence unfold more as the story unfolds. Verse 14. We see the response of Naomi's daughters-in-law to her. They lifted up their voices and wept again. Feel this pain. Naomi feels entirely worthless. Her life is misery. She can't provide for herself, let alone her daughters-in-law. She's old, they're young. There's no hope for her. She's going to go back to Israel. She's going to be a beggar. But they're young enough. Maybe they can find a husband in their homeland, someone that will protect them, someone that will provide for them. So once more, she pushes them away. And the women scream out in agony and weep. To be so consumed by pain that you scream out and weep is a deep, deep sorrow. And these two women, Orpah and Ruth, are not the same. There's a night and day contrast between the two of them, and the author of Ruth directs us to that contrast at the end of verse 14. Look with me at it. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Up to a point, Orpah will follow Naomi. But when Naomi pushes back and states that she has nothing to give her, Orpah cries out, weeps, and kisses her mother-in-law goodbye. Not so Ruth. Ruth clings to Naomi. Naomi. This is the word debak. It means cling, stick, cleave, hold fast. Orpah kisses Naomi goodbye, but Ruth holds fast. Verse 15. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Once more, Naomi pushes Ruth away, but Ruth won't leave. Her, ver- her response in verse 16 is bold as it is beautiful. Look with me at it. Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. Ruth here pledges her loyalty both to Naomi and to Yahweh. Where Naomi goes, she will go. Where Naomi lodges, she will lodge. Where Naomi dies, she will die. Naomi's people will be her people and Naomi's God will be her God. Ruth is no mere pagan Moabite. She has pledged her loyalty to Yahweh. She has confessed him as her God. And consider this. She steps out in faith, leaving behind her culture, her country, and her kin. Charles Spurgeon puts it like this. It is one thing to love the ways of the Lord when all is fair. Quite another thing to cleave to them under all discouragements and difficulties. The kiss of outward profession is very cheap and easy, but the practical cleaving to the Lord, which must show itself in holy decision for truth and holiness, is no small matter. Verse 18. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. So the two of them went on their way until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this... Naomi? When Ruth and Naomi get back home to Bethlehem, the people are shocked. These past 10 years have taken their toll on Naomi. As she enters the city with Ruth by her side, all the people are gathered and stunned and looking at her. I mean, physically, obviously she's been so stressed, so heartbroken that it's just, it's all over her. 
She's probably, her, her clothes are probably dusty and dirty and rags at this point. And they're looking at this sad side and they said, is this Naomi? Verse 20, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Noemi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Naomi's name means pleasant and lovely. Mara means bitter. Naomi says, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. Ten years earlier, when she left Bethlehem, she had a husband and two sons. And now she has nothing. That there's a stir when she arrives and that the, the people of the city come to greet her tells us that Naomi was well known. And she probably lived up to her name as pleasant and lovely. And that's why they're shocked when she comes in and they say, is this her? Naomi then asks a question that reveals her deep, correct understanding of theology. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? There are fewer messages more unpopular to contemporary Christianity than God's sovereignty and God's providence. The truth that God governs all things, God orchestrates all things, He either brings about or permits all things. We live in a Christianity that repels against that and pushes back against that. We live in a Christianity with a weak, worried God who is, is responding to all of these things that he didn't see. But that is not the God of the Bible. And that is not the God that Naomi knows. She rightly understands that nothing in this world happens by chance. That everything happens in this world either because God decrees it or permits it. The theological term for this is providence. And providence is God's persevering and governing all things. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. This is God speaking. I am God, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring from the end, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things yet not done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. Isaiah 45, 6 through 7, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Naomi rightly understands that all of her sorrows come from God's providential hand. And admittedly, she has been dealt a bad hand. And while she has the right doctrine, her perspective is off. Her insistence on being called bitter reveals us, reveals this. And like any of us in her position, Naomi only sees bleakness and feels tormented. And when we're in that state, we don't see things clearly. When we're in a bitter providence and when life is just giving us blow after blow after blow and it's just heartache and sorrow and tears, we, we don't see past that. We don't. Most of us. I don't. When my eyes are filled with tears, that's all I see. It's, it's blurry. I don't have perspective. And the, the perpetual torment Tor or the perpetual temptation for us and in, in when we're like Naomi here is just to despair. John Piper writes this, seeing is a precious gift and bitterness is a powerful blindness. When we're in the furnace of affliction, we don't see things clearly. When we get better, bitter, we are blind to what God is doing. Remarkably, God oftentimes works through our pain to accomplish his glory and our good. Sin, evil, suffering, these are the results of, the, of a broken world. Make no doubt about it. But God uses these elements to bring about his plans. 
While Naomi and Ruth enter Bethlehem poor and brokenhearted, drowning in their sorrow, they are fulfilling God's plan to usher in a king and to bring to the world the one who would deem, redeem the world. But they don't see that. How could they? They're blind to it. They have no idea that God is going to bring this incredible pain and sorrow in their life to redeem the world. God is working, although they can't see it. The bitter providence they're experiencing begins to change in chapter two. Now, Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So far in this story, we have felt nothing but hopelessness and pain. The only thing we have experienced is a bitter providence. But now, Boaz enters the story. He is a relative of Elimelech, Naomi's husband. He isn't a brother, so it's likely that he's Naomi's cousin or uncle. He's described as being a worthy man, and the word worthy is the Hebrew hayil, and it means power, strength, wealth, and bravery. Hayil is used in the Old Testament to describe men of valor, to describe wealthy men, to describe fighting, tough men. So Boaz is a man of good character. And as, as the story continues, we'll see he doesn't just have goodly character, he has godly character. He is a manly man. He is tough. He is wealthy. Naomi and Ruth aren't aware of it yet, but he is also their kinsman. And a kinsman is what is needed to redeem them. And so with the entrance of Boaz into the story, we as readers, our tension's rising. It's like, wait a second, the guy that they need to save the day is here. Look with me at verse two. Ru Ruth and Naomi don't know about him yet. Check this out, verse two. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I find favor. And she said, go, my daughter. While Bethlehem is Naomi's home, they still need to do something to survive. They need to eat. And in the Mosaic law in Leviticus 19, 9 through 10, and Deuteronomy 24, 19, God makes a provision for the poor and the immigrant to survive. In Leviticus 9, we read this. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right to the edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, and you not, shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor, for the sojourner, that's an immigrant, Deuteronomy 24, 19. When you reap your harvest in, the, in, the, in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, do not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the, the immigrant, the fatherless and the widow, that the Lord may bless you in the work of your hands. The, this isn't welfare. The poor aren't just given money or food, which fosters a lazy culture. No, no, no. This is better. The poor and the needy must work. And when they work, there is a guarantee they will be fed. God actually sets up the system of Israel so that if you're a landowner and you're, you're getting fruit, you're getting grain, you're getting barley, getting wheat, grapes, you don't pick it all. You leave the, the corners untouched so that way the poor, the fatherless, the widows, they can come in and they can at least survive. They can eat. So Ruth goes into the field to work. Verse three. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And look at this. She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. This verse is like a joke. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little cute thing. It's a tongue-in-cheek. The author of Hebrews is one of the, one, or the Hebrews, the author of Ruth is establishing to us God's providence, right? We just covered all of that in, in, in chapter one. Nothing happens by accident. And here he's being cutesy. He's, he's doing a little literary device, a little joke, a little irony. It just happened that Ruth comes to the very field of the one person in the land who is ready to save the day. As a good a man that we've already been introduced to as a worthy man, good, strong, and kind. Verse four, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Notice Boaz's piety here. He's a godly man. He greets those underneath him by saying, the Lord bless you. 
This is light in a dark place. Remember, this is the time of the judges. This is the time where the people of Israel are doing whatever they want, serving whatever God they want. And here's this man, Boaz, who greets his workers with this, Yahweh be with you. And they respond, Yahweh bless you. And while he's in the field supervising the harvest work, Ruth catches his eye. Here is this beautiful young woman. And she stands out to him because she's out here in the heat of the day. It's probably April or May at this time. And she is working the field. And Boaz is interested. Look at verse 5. Then Boaz said to his young man who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, She is the young Moabite woman who came back from Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued until early morning, until now, except for a short rest. Boaz's field manager here is functioning as a good wingman. He tells Boaz all that has taken place. He tells Boaz Ruth's story. Look at verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men to not touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Boaz is a godly man. He greets his laborers with a blessing from Yahweh. He provides for the poor and for the immigrant as the God's law demands. But he does more than that. He protects Ruth and he provides for Ruth. Like today, it was a dangerous thing for a woman to be alone. Today, it's not smart for young girls and women to go out into the city after dark. We all know that. It's it's just common sense. And in those days, it's not good for women to be in the field alone. Why? Time of the judges. There's no police. The, 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 The threat of being raped in the, in the light of day, was very, very real. Because the people of Israel did whatever they wanted. Rape and murder were ever-present dangers. And, and Boaz is gracious. He's kind. He takes care of Ruth. He tells his young men, don't touch her. Look after her. Boaz himself probably has a soft spot, soft spot for foreigners. Because Boaz's great-grandmother herself was a foreigner. Matthew 1, 5, or his grandmother rather, Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Remember Rahab, the, the, pro, the pagan prostitute from Jericho that Ethan preached about last week. That's Boaz's grandma. And so Boaz would have had a soft spot in his heart for women who were not Jews, women who were down on their luck, because that's his own story. More than that, once Boaz's wingman fills him in, Boaz realizes that This is Naomi's daughter-in-law, and that means that she's his kin. She's his extended family. Though not her husband, Boaz is protecting her from sexual assault, and he is providing her with food and drink. Verse 10. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Not only is Ruth a hard worker, she's humble. She isn't entitled. She understands her situation. She's the outsider. She's the immigrant. She's the foreigner. Nobody owes her nothing. And because of this humility, Ruth is prepared to see and appreciate when someone is gracious to her. John Piper comments, proud people don't feel amazed at being treated well. They don't feel deep gratefulness, but humble people do. In fact, they're made even more humble by being treated graciously. They are so amazed that grace came to them in their unworthiness that they feel even more lowly. But they receive the gift. Joy increases, not self-importance. Grace is not intended to replace lowliness with pride. It's intended to replace sorrow with joy. Verse 11. Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. 
The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Boaz commends Ruth. She's an extraordinary woman, and he expresses his admiration of her. In verse 12, Boaz blesses her. He calls upon Yahweh to give her back all that she's lost and to reward her. He then proclaims that Ruth has come under the wings of God. And you say, that's an odd phrase. What does that mean? To be under God's wings means to be under God's protection. This is why the psalmist in Psalm 57, 1 prays this. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you, my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings, I take refuge till the storm of destruction pass by. Ruth has now found refuge. She's found a safe place, a place of protection, a place of rest. Boaz, protection and provision for Ruth continues in verses 14 through 16. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. She sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed the young man saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her and also pull out from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So it's now time to eat. You could say that Ruth and Boaz are on their first day, although Ruth doesn't know it because Boaz is is kind of being a chicken here. And every guy in this room can relate to this feeling, this nervousness before you shoot your shot. What is she going to do? Is she going to accept me? Is she going to say yes? Let's just be friends. Are we friends? You know, there's no define. There's no DTR. Define the relationship. We're just we're just kind of we're just kind of hanging out. We're eating together. So, and I I love this. Look look at this. this is so funny. I love the details of the verses. When the Bible like really slows things down and gives you a lot of details, it's meant to draw attention to it. And look at these details of the meal. Boaz hands Ruth the roasted grain personally. Wealthy, worthy man. And if you're a servant that's working these fields, you're probably watching and being like, because, you know, the, the love is blind, but the neighbors ain't. Like, we all understand that, right? Well, Boaz, what is he doing here? He's giving this lady bread. She eats until she's fat, satisfied. It's probably been a long time since Ruth had a decent full meal, and at mealtime, she eats her fill. After the meal, Boaz continues taking care of Ruth. By law, Ruth can only take the grain that has fallen off the stock or grain that's, that's been on the outside here. But Roaz, Bo, Roaz, Boaz tells the men that she can go anywhere in the field and pick whatever she wants. And more than that, he tells his men, the, the, the barley that we've already picked in the bundles, pull it out of the bag and just throw it all over the place so she can get it herself. So Boaz is lightening her workload. She's not going to have to pick the barley herself. Verse 17, so she gleaned until the field, in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she gleaned, and, was a, and it was about an ephah of barley. Hardworking Ruth continues working until night, and she has around five gallons of barley. Verse 18, she took it up and went to the city. Her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left after being satisfied. Ruth returns home with the barley and the leftover from, from dinner, and she gives food to Naomi, and Naomi's shocked. Look at verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean, and where have you worked? Look, this is funny. Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Naomi's an old lady. She's worldly wise. She knows that Ruth could not have done this on her own. She knows that Ruth must have had help. Ruth is young. Ruth is beautiful. Ruth comes home with two weeks' worth of food, a cooked meal, and a smile. Naomi instinctively assumes Ruth has caught the eye of a man, and she says so. I love her direct indirectness here. Blessed is the man who took notice of you. My mom is like this. She knows what's going on even when I don't know what's going on, and she asks these kind of questions all the time, like leading questions. Uh, that's, what, that's what Naomi's doing here. She's having a leading piety. Ruth comes in. Blessed is the man who, who did this for you, who took notice of you. Naomi's trying to pull information out of Ruth. Look at the next verse. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, 
and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Ruth comes home with all this food and Naomi's response is, who is he? (laughs) Ruth can't help herself. She tells Naomi about Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi knows God's providence. She's experiencing it. Her understanding of God's sovereignty was so real that she proclaimed that his hand had treated her bitterly. But with this turn of providence, notice that Naomi once again reaffirms her commitment to God's orchestration of all things. And instead of lamenting hardship, she celebrates God's kindness. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Naomi now fills Ruth in on Boaz's identity. He's their relative. He's one of the redeemers. The term here is goel. Goel or redeemer is someone in Israel who did several things for a family. If you were murdered, a goel or a redeemer would go avenge your blood. He would go all Clint Eastwood and go out there and shoot the guy dead. That's what he would do. Um, If you had land and the family was in hardship and they had to sell the land under duress, the family member, the goel, the redeemer, he could sweep in and buy back that land. If you were a man and you died and your wife was left uh, impoverished and alone, the redeemer would come along and he would marry her and protect her and provide for her and ensure that your line continued. Naomi's rejoicing and celebrating because Boaz could be their redeemer. These two women are downright giddy. They're bursting with excitement and and Ruth tells Naomi even more. Look, Look at verse 21. Besides this, he said to me, you shall keep close by my young men until they've all finished harvest. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman less than another field, you be assaulted. So, so, so Naomi tells Ruth, stay in Boaz's field. You will be safe there. Verse 23, so she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Well, it's now summertime. A couple of weeks go by. Ruth continues working in the fields under Boaz's protection. In chapter 3, Naomi makes a bold move. And she instructs Ruth to do something incredibly risky. Let's look at it in chapter 3 with the threshing floor. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, would I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? For a few weeks, even maybe a month or two, Naomi has witnessed Boaz's continued generosity for Ruth. He's single. She's single. Obviously, he's interested. But at this point, Boaz is not making the move, at least directly. So Naomi schemes. She intervenes. She plays matchmaker here. And she comes up with an audacious plot. In verse 2 through 4, we read the details of this plot from Naomi. Look with me at it. Is Boaz not a relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing tonight on the threshing floor. Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say I will do. There's a lot going on here. And there have been many interpretations of exactly what this means. What's clear is that Naomi is instructing Ruth to propose to Boaz. Commentators are pretty scattered in offering explanations as to what this means. And the reason why there there are so many different opinions is because I'm going to tell you right now, this is scandalous. This is provocative. So let's try our best to make sense of it. First, step one, Ruth is to wash herself and anoint herself. This is the language of preparation, specifically preparation for marriage and sex. The same language will surface in Ezekiel 16, 9 through 12 for that very same reason. So the first thing that Ruth is to do is to prepare herself physically for marriage and for sex. Second, the location is incredibly suggestive. 
All of this is going to take place on the threshing floor. The threshing floor is the place where men separate the chaff from the grain. And during this season, like Boaz is doing right now, the men would work so late into the night that they would sleep there to protect their, their work. And when the, while the men are sleeping at the threshing floor, prostitutes would come and get business at the threshing floor. This takes place in Hosea 9.1. Third, Naomi, Ruth is to wait until Boaz has eaten dinner, drink, and gone to sleep. And then fourth, she's to uncover his feet and lie down next to him. What, we're, what we have to understand is that this is highly likely, what is taking place is not what you heard in Sunday school as a kid. Right? Prepare yourself. By her uncovering Boaz's feet, in all likelihood does not mean she called down next to him and pulled up his pants or his not a skirt, but you know, this thing, and uncovered his feet and laid down. That's probably the least, like the bare minimum. In the Old Testament, feet was a euphemism for man's genitalia. We see this in Judges 3.24 and 1 Samuel 24.4. And I'm going to read from the King James Version because the King James Version, strangely, I didn't realize this, is the only version, it's the most literal version in this regard um, for this specific translation. Our modern translations use a euphemism for a euphemism, which just confuses everything. So the Hebrew euphemism is feet. Our ESV translates feet, uncovering feet, as relieving yourself. All right, so that's an English euphemism. So English euphemism for Hebrew euphemism for something that's not actually literally feet. So Judges 3.24, King James Version. When he had gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, the, the, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, surely he covereth his feet in the summer chamber. He's going to use the bathroom, so he is, he is pulling his pants down, and his feet are covered, okay? Uh, other Old Testament passages take feet and legs as a euphemism for man's nakedness. Jeremiah 13, 22. If thou say in thine heart, wherefore come these things upon me, for the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered, thy heels are made bare. So there's a scandal, men. Your heels have been made bare. Now, is the scandal that your Israeli pants came up and everybody saw your feet, is that scandalous? No. It's that your pants came up and something else was seen and the Bible's being gentle and they're calling that whole area your feet, your lower half. Now, I'm guessing that you're feeling uncomfortable with all of this and that's okay. The language is uncomfortable, it's ambiguous and it's intentionally charged. Understand what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that Ruth uncovers Boaz completely. I'm not saying that, Bo that Ruth makes Boaz naked. But I think it's undeniable that Ruth's actions are provocative. Or as one commentator remarks, it creates a sexually charged atmosphere. Put this to the test. When a woman crawls into bed with a man at night, one thing leads to another. And at the very least, that's what Ruth is doing here. Sinclair Ferguson captures this tension well. He says, this passage raises serious questions, unsettling questions about the risk to which Naomi is prepared to expose Boaz. Perfume, nighttime, good food and wine, the warm physical closeness of a, an attractive woman. Who could miss the apparent message? Would a man not find himself tempted and is that not the central part of the plan? Is there a hint of more, an invitation of physical intimacy? The word translated feet is translated legs in Deuteronomy 10.6. We are uncertain exactly what is happening here. Finally, after this has taken place, Ruth is to wait Boaz's instruction. Boaz will tell you what to do. What Naomi is planning for Ruth is beyond bold. How would this happen? What would Boaz do? Would Boaz wake up and have sex with her? Would Boaz wake up and be offended at her forwardness and send her out of the way? Would Boaz say, no more, woman. You're, you, you, what are you doing? You, no, you cannot glean here anymore. Wrong message. At any rate, Ruth agrees to Naomi's plan. Look at verse six. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went down to, he lied down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly, uncovered his feet and lay down. 
Ruth's heart is pounding inside of her chest. Her palms are sweaty. How is Boaz going to react? What will he say? What will he do? Verse 8. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Ruth is vulnerable, and she answers Boaz with bold timidity. Her identifying herself as sweet, look what she says. I'm Ruth, your servant. And then she repeats back to him what he told her in chapter two. In verse 12, when he said, the Lord repay you for what you've done. A full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. She says, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant. She tells Boaz to spread his wings over her. She's saying, Boaz, protect me. Boaz, provide for me. Boaz, be my refuge. Boaz, be my husband. Marry me, Boaz. And the last phrase of Ruth's response is is hilarious. It's like Ruth has to spell it out for Boaz. She says, for you are my redeemer. Like, Like picture the tension. He wakes up. Who's this? What are you doing? I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over me. Boaz is still trying to wake up. What? What? For your redeemer. Ah, it all makes sense, Boaz says. Verse 10. May you be blessed by the Lord. Lord, my daughter, you have made this last kindness greater than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do all that you ask, for my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning he will redeem If he redeem you good, let him do it. But if he will not redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Naomi's gamble works. Boaz is an honorable man. He doesn't take advantage of the situation. Here is this young, beautiful woman that he admires, that he loves. She comes to him in the middle of the night with a provocative proposal, and he exercises remarkable self-control. Both Boaz and Ruth are examples of the right thing to do, which is to wait for, sex, wait for marriage for sex. And before we go any further, we have to ask ourselves, why go about this to begin with? Why this plan from Naomi's part? Wouldn't it have been easier just for Ruth one day in the field to be like, hey, I'm single, you're single, you're my kinsman, why don't we, why don't we work this out? Um, why go through all of this crazy plot? Um, John Piper's explanation of these events is really helpful. So I'm going to read it in its entirety because this is really good. Piper writes this. It's not easy for an older man to express love to a younger woman. It would be doubly humiliating if she declined, both because he's a man and because he presumed to think a younger woman would be interested in him. Boaz did it with deeds of kindness and subtle words of admiration. He said he admired her for coming under God's wings. He acted as though she were under his, and he waited. In the course of time, Naomi and Ruth hit upon a response just as subtle, just as profound. Ruth will come to him in sleep and in the grain field where he has taken her under his care, and she will say yes. But she will say it with an action just as subtle as the action and words of Boaz. She puts herself under his wings, so to speak, and when he wakes, everything hangs on one sentence and whether Ruth has interpreted Boaz correctly. I imagine her pulse racing as Boaz awoke. Then came the all-important words, I am Ruth, spread your wing over your maidservant. I picture an immense silence for a moment while Boaz let himself believe that this magnificent woman had really understood, had so proudly and sensitively understood A middle-aged man is interested in a young widow whom he discreetly calls my daughter, uncertain whether her heart may be going after younger men, communicating with a subtle word picture that he wants to be God's wings for her. Then a young widow gradually reads between the lines and finally asks for an interpretation by coming in the middle of the night to take refuge under the wing of his garment. That's powerful stuff. Anybody who thinks about loose woman and a finagling mother-in-law at work here are missing something beautiful. All is subtle. All is righteous. All is strategic. Boaz agrees. He will marry her, but there's a, there's a, there's a, a blockade here. While Boaz is a kinsman, there's someone who has, a, 
who is a closer relative than him. Someone has a better claim on Ruth than him. So he tells her, go home. I will take care of this this very day. Verse 14, she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before anyone could recognize her. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. She held it out and he measured six measures of barley and put it on her. She went to the city and when he came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the man turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Boaz wakes her up and sends her on her way before anyone can recognize her, before dawn breaks. And he sends her with 50 pounds of barley to, as a gift to his mother-in-law. Boaz is a smart guy. <laughs> chapter, chapter four, we finally have the redemption. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat there and behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside friend and sit down. And he turned aside and sat down and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and sat down here and they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of the land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I will come after you. And then something unexpected happens. Look at what the Redeemer says. I will redeem it. This is not part of the plan. The guy with the better claim claims Ruth. He will be the Redeemer. He agrees to buy the land. And as readers, we're caught up in the drama and we should be feeling frustrated at this. This is a love story. Romeo, just say yes. Boaz and Ruth are to be together. Who is this guy even? He doesn't even have a name. You're telling me that, that Boaz, the worthy man, is going to be the redeemer. Until this guy comes along, this nameless nobody. Who's this guy? Feel the tension, feel the weight. Don't, don't, don't let your familiarity with the story just go, eh. No, no, no. This is dramatic, man. But Boaz has a final card to play. Look at verse five. Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the, the hand of Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own Inheritance, take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Whoever this guy is doesn't, he wants the land, but he doesn't want the girl. Because if he gets the girl, they're going to have kids. And if they have kids, his own kids from his other marriage, they're going to get, they're going to get shafted with the inheritance. So he says, you know what? I don't want her. You have her. So Boaz and Ruth will marry. And all of us can collectively exhale in relief. In verse 7 through 12, the author explains to us the custom of the time. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have brought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and it belonged to Chilion and to Melhon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Melhon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and all the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you act worthy in Ephrath and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. The elders witness the ceremony and they bless it. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Boaz and Ruth marry. They have a son together. It's all beautiful and right. It's a reversal of fortunes. It's a reversal of where our story began. The book began with Naomi and Ruth losing everything. It was heartbreaking and hopeless. And it ends here with Naomi and Ruth being redeemed. It was celebratory and hope-filled. Naomi then blesses Boaz, 
Ruth and their son, and this blessing would prove to be prophetic. Look at verse 14. The woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. And may, or Naomi, Ruth rather blesses Naomi, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of old age. For your daughter in law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Ruth tells Naomi that her son will be a restorer of life and a nourisher of old age. That's high language, that's messianic language. The son of Ruth and Boaz will be a remarkable person. Our curiosity now peaks. Who is this person? Look at verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been given to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Ruth and Boaz's son is Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. This son of Ruth and Boaz will be the grandfather of none other than David, the man who will be the greatest king in Israel's history. Now this book's inclusion in the Bible begins to make sense. This isn't just some beautiful love story. It's a beautiful love story that tells us how King David comes to be. And then the book ends with a genealogy. Look at verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. This is a random anticlimactic ending, isn't it? If we were writing this story, we would have ended it at verse 17. This is how David came to be king, the greatest king. But that's not how Ruth ends. Ruth ends with a genealogy, and this is intentional because it triggers in our mind another genealogy, the genealogy that we've been working through this Advent series. Turn with me in closing to Matthew chapter 1 and follow me as I read. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Animadab, and Animadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth. This love story between Ruth and Boaz would not lead to the greatest king in Israel, but would lead to the great king, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. This isn't just a story about two women being redeemed. It's a story about how you and I can be redeemed. John MacArthur comments, Ruth is a fitting symbol for every believer, and even of the church itself, redeemed, brought into a position of great favor, endowed with riches and privilege, exalted to be the Redeemer's own bride, and loved by him with the profoundest affection. This is why the extraordinary story of her redemption ought to make every true believer's heart resonate with profound gladness and thanksgiving for the one who likewise redeemed us for our sin. This is a story about God's sovereignty, about his providence, about his directing our lives, even when our lives are at our worst. It's about him working to bring about his glory and our good when the only thing that we feel is pain and see darkness. God is at work to do great good. John Piper was so helpful for me in studying this majestic book this week, and I will leave the final words with him this morning to him. The book of Ruth reveals the hidden hand of God in the bitter experiences of his people. The point of this book is not just that God is preparing the way for the coming of the king of glory, but that he is doing it in such a way that all of us should learn that the worst of times are not wasted. They are not wasted globally, historically, or personally. God is at work in the the worst of times. He is at work doing a thousand things that no one can see but him. In the case of this story, God is at work preparing the way for Christ in a manner no one can see. Let's pray. Father, what a remarkable story this is of pain and providence, of redemption, 
of love and loyalty. We thank you for books like this that tell stories that we can all relate to. Who doesn't love a good love story? We Father, Father, we thank you that, that you work through our pain and through the, the ordinariness of life to bring about even something like this, the redemption of the world. So Father, I know this morning your people are hurting. Your people are in pain. I know people in here are in the midst of it and they don't see the mountaintop. They're in the valley. They're in the dark. So Father, I, I ask that now through your spirit you would comfort them that this story of Ruth and Boaz would be a light in their darkness, that you would show them that even though they can't see it, you are aware of their pain, you're working through their pain, and you are working for your glory and for their good and for their happiness and their joy. Father, help us to be a people who celebrate and trust in your sovereignty and in your providence. Help us to be a people who love, honor, and exalt your son Jesus, who is our Redeemer. These things we ask in Christ's name, amen.